I'm going to talk about pottery, and you may wonder whether archaeologists spend too much time focusing on pottery. The answer is yes, but it happens to be uh, one of the best preserved materials that we have. It stores a wealth of information. Um, a lot of questions can be answered uh, by doing pottery analysis. So I'm going to talk about pottery vessel form and function and use some examples uh, from Florida assemblages at the Florida Museum. Pottery has been used for a, a wide range of uh, functions, including cooking, storage, serving, uh, transport. Uh, most of uh, what we're dealing with are containers. They, they hold something. And I'm going to talk about some of the, um, the vessel attributes that we can uh, record to understand what a vessel was used for. And I think it's worth pointing out that uh, looking at any one particular artifact and understanding what it was used for um, is kind of a piece of trivia. But if we have a, a large assemblage and we're looking at um, lots of vessels represented from one site or many different sites, then we can actually see some patterns uh, in uh, how vessels were used, how they were made, um, that, that can help answer some significant questions. I'm going to start with uh, cooking vessels. There are two basic types of cooking, wet cooking and dry cooking. So you have your boiling and simmering, and you have things like baking and parching. For, for boiling and simmering, for wet cooking, you need vessels that have uh, walls that are somewhat vertical, so it can hold the material, obviously. Uh, boiling was really a, a popular cooking method in, uh, in Florida for thousands of years. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining uh, uh, some of those vessels. And there's essentially two types of uh, wet cooking, uh, direct heat cooking and indirect heat cooking. And direct heat cooking is, um, is done by putting a vessel into uh, a fire or a heat source. An example of a, of a vessel that um, would go on top of a fire would be something like this one here. This, this particular vessel has, has uh, nice vertical walls. The vessel would actually be placed into uh, the ashes. Uh, and the, the flames would, would actually uh, come up around the vessel. Uh, it has some particular characteristics. It has to be um, wide enough that the, the contents can be accessed. Um, oftentimes with uh, boiling, the, the contents have to be stirred so you don't scorch the, um, the contents. Um, it has to be thick enough uh, at the base that there's enough uh, thermal resistance that it's not going to crack. The vessel actually, in terms of orifice, can't be too wide so that there's lots and lots of evaporation. So you, you don't want a, a really wide open bowl. Something like this is, is best suited. Another kind of wet cooking, boiling over coals, uh, over embers, where a vessel might be suspended has different kinds of morphological attributes. So it has um, more of a rounded base, something that um, is uh, sort of provides more surface area over um, a, a flat surface of heat versus heat that's kind of um, surrounding the vessel. So this would be over uh, coals and suspended like with these lug handles. And this is the kind of uh, vessel that is actually really common throughout the southeastern United States um, kind of in the, the late uh, pre-Columbian period, the Mississippian period uh, where uh, hominy, this corn uh, kind of uh, concoction that um, had to cook for uh, many hours. This is a sort of more um, uh, kind of quicker uh, cooking for maybe an hour or less. So these are, are direct heat cooking. Um, this vessel actually has a very thin uh, vessel base because uh, it needs to be able to conduct the heat um, pretty well and efficiently uh, for a long period, whereas this base is thick um, because it actually just stabilizes the vessel down in the, in the ashes and it's not used for as long a period of time. Now there's another kind of cooking uh, that's indirect heat cooking, also known as stone boiling, where hot objects are essentially cycled through the vessel. 
rather than the heat source being on the outside, it's on the inside. And so rather than conducting heat, you want to insulate the contents of the vessel. And this is an example, which is, um, this is, this is actually the oldest vessel we have here, uh, which is 4,000 years old. It's a late archaic uh, fiber tempered vessel. And there's, there's a few attributes that are important. One is that, uh, and this is just half of the vessel. You can see um, half of it is, is essentially missing, include, as well as the base. Uh, some of the important attributes are it's, it's very wide. So you, you, you have to uh, cycle stones or uh, baked clay objects or, or other hot materials um, to keep things cooking. So you might have to remove those objects and put new ones in multiple times during given cooking episode. Uh, and so you need to have uh, easy access to the contents. With a really deep vessel, that might be more cumbersome. The vessel's thick. Uh, the vessel walls are, are relatively thick. These are about a, um, a centimeter or more thick, whereas in, in these cooking vessels, they're, they're about half that. So it's an insulating body. It's keeping the, the heat in instead of conducting it through the body. And then the fiber temper helps with that as well because it uh, provides these voids. They're essentially like uh, what you find in like an ice cooler. Uh, these, these gaps actually um, keep the heat from propagating through the, the wall. Uh, whereas these are um, often mineral tempered, tempered with things like quartz sand that actually conducts uh, heat better than the, uh, than the fired clay itself. And it's worth mentioning that these, all these vessels are, um, they're technically earthenware, which means that they're, they're fired uh, less to a temperature of less than about 800 degrees Celsius. And that's because they're all fired in, in open pits or open uh, bonfires. There are no kilns that were used. Uh, some other vessel functions. Um, one is serving, and serving vessels uh, come in a variety of forms. Uh, one kind of common serving form actually cross-culturally is something like this, just a small open bowl. So it doesn't have any um, particular requirements other than being um, you know, easily uh, moved around, easily picked up and, and manipulated by one person. Um, they're also, oh, and these also uh, often have uh, decoration because they're used in kind of public settings. Um, so, you know, people might bring out their finery or have particular kind of uh, messages they want to convey uh, with these kinds of uh, objects. So this one is red painted. And then there's also uh, really large vessels that we think were serving vessels like this one over here. Uh, this is upside down. It's too fragile to turn over, um, but it's a... It's a wide open bowl uh, that would not really be that good for cooking, uh, although there is some, uh, some sooting on the exterior that shows that it, that it was used at some time uh, for cooking. It actually has evidence that it was used over a really long period of time. It has all these mend holes that hold together these coil breaks. This vessel um, basically uh, fell apart over years of, of use and um, and people tried to keep it together. And it's, it's actually a, a rare example where we see so many holes that were drilled into this and then, and then twine uh, was used to, to patch it together. So it's kind of like a Frankenstein uh, kind of vessel held together. Um, obviously not used for cooking liquid at this point because it, it's become sort of like a colander, um, but maybe a, you know, a really important heirloom um, that would have been used in some kind of public setting. Um, and then there are some vessels that, that um, are obviously not good for um, most cooking purposes. This is a kind of uh, common form that we call a flattened globular bowl. It's not exactly good for um, maybe serving uh, liquids because it's hard to pour with this kind of um, shape. It's not really that good for cooking uh, either. Uh, and there's actually no residues that we ever find in any of these. In addition to the form of the vessels, we can look at evidence of use, which comes in the form of uh, sooting on the exterior that shows that it was used over fire, uh, charred residues on the interior uh, that basically show it was used for cooking, um, and then things like abrasions that could happen with stirring or even washing the vessel repeatedly. Uh, and then we could also get into to things like um, residue analyses, absorbed residues that we can do with um, more advanced uh, techniques or uh, you know, starch grain analyses, things like that that can be removed. 
this kind of vessel uh, with a really restricted opening, a neck basically on a bottle, you know, we know that this is used for, uh, for liquid transport and, and probably serving as well. So these are um, kind of ideal forms to work with. You're looking with, working with whole vessels, uh, but in archeology span mostly we're dealing with much smaller pieces. Uh, but there are ways that we can uh, basically go from smaller sherds to get back to these vessels that we want to understand uh, their function. Um, and we do that mostly, uh, in most cases, with rim sherds because the rims are, are what really um, hold the most information. So I have a few smaller um, examples here. And um, you know, when a vessel is broken into a lot of pieces, if you wind up with, uh, with body sherds like this, there's no way to really understand um, what the vessel form is. There's not a whole lot that you can do with this. But if you have a, a bigger portion of the rim, you can a, approximate uh, what the vessel form is. And this is uh, some kind of colored jar. It's worth noting that uh, on this vessel, it, it could be kind of a, a taller jar or it could be a, a shorter bowl. We don't really know based on the portion that's remaining. Uh, but there are a few attributes that we, um, that we routinely record and one is the diameter of the opening, the orifice diameter, uh, which we can get from the curvature of the rim. And uh, we use, this is really common basic practice, we use these uh, uh, rim charts, these templates, that are just basically have uh, concentric circles of various uh, widths, diameters of the, um, the vessel and you match up the curvature of your sample to the curvature of, of these uh, templates. And, and you know, really, if you have more than 10% of the, of the total uh, rim, then you can get a, a really good approximation or even uh, totally accurate of um, the total diameter. If you have uh, between five and 10%, the accuracy decreases less than 5% and you're, you're really out of luck and it doesn't work very well. Um, we also record the profile of the vessel and uh, you want to know how the, the lip is oriented. And an easy way to do this, if you have enough of it, is that you can put it flat onto the table. And that's basically 180 degrees um, of the orientation of the vessel sitting upright. So all parts of it touch the table. Uh, and so you know how it's, how it's oriented and you can identify uh, the vessel form. And then the other thing is we, we measure the thickness of the vessel at a specified uh, distance below the, the lip. So you want it to all be comparable across vessels. And so um, often we measure three centimeters below the lip of the vessel, so, so it's all comparable. Um, we use, for the vessel uh, profiles, we use these form gauges. We press it into the side of the vessel, and you can trace that out onto a paper. Uh, do it for the other side, measure the thickness, and, and, uh, and draw that out. And then obviously just basic calipers to uh, measure the thickness. And, um, and based on that, we can basically get back to what um, the whole vessel forms might have been for those smaller sherds. Um, but there are some limitations, like I said, in terms of uh, the, usually the, the bottom uh, half or more of, of the vessel. We don't always know what that might have looked at like. Uh, for things like a bowl, you want to see curvature um, happening uh, pretty soon down the vessel profile and something with uh, like a, a pot, you want to see the, the profile extending vertically um, further down.